Well, it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague, uh, Mark Barton. Mark grew up in the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia region, where his father, Paul B. Barton Jr., was a prominent economic geologist and geochemist working at the U.S. Geological Survey. Mark's interest and expertise has always been broad and initially focused on mineralogy and experimental petrology, uh, but focusing from the beginning on systems that were of interest to economic geologists. Mark earned his BS at Virginia Tech in geology in 1977, uh, his MS at Virginia Tech in 1978 on the silver gold sulfur system, and his PhD at the University of Chicago in geology in 1981 under Julian Goldsmith on the thermodynamic properties of topaz and some minerals in the BEO AL203 SiO2H2O system, which is actually how I first got connected with Mark because of my PhD involved a bunch of veins that contain topaz. Uh, while a student, Mark spent summers doing quadrangle scale geological mapping in Eureka, Nevada, uh, being mentored by the USGS director, uh, Tom Nolan. And he was also sneaking in some mineral collecting. Uh, from 81 to 83, Mark was a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution in Washington, D.C., where he shared an office with Marco Einaudi, who was a professor of economic geology at Stanford University. Uh, who happened to be doing a po uh, sabbatical at Carnegie and Mark and Marco shared an office. Uh, Marco introduced Mark to the Anaconda style of geological mapping, which is a semi-quantitative technique designed to focus on mineral sites and, dis and to distinguish hand lens scale observations from other things like interpretations. And Mark says that this really ignited further interest in the field of economic geology and started to shift uh, what the topics of his investigations. He subsequently took a faculty position at UCLA beginning in 84, and he won early career awards from both the Mineralogical Society of America in 91 and the Society of Economic Geologists in 92. And in 1990, Mark was recruited to lead the economic geology program at the U of A uh, while Bill Dickinson was department chair. So the U of A basically stole Mark from UCLA at that point. Uh, and to date, uh, I haven't made a count, but I'm guessing Mark uh, at the two institutions has probably advised 80 or more grad students on really diverse topics. At the U of, it, U of A, his passion was to secure the long-term future of economic geology here, uh, for which he's sacrificed con considerable time that could have been devoted to science, but instead has been dedicated to administration and fundraising, uh, leading to the endowed chair that I hold and one for which the geosciences department is currently involved in a faculty search. Over the years, he's been a key founder of consortia and collaborative groups such as the Center for Mineral Resources and the Lowell Institute for Mineral Resources, where he is currently co-director. And this campus umbrella organization for mineral resource related activities at the Lowell IMR is about to gain greater visibility, perhaps as a new uh, school, so to speak. Mark has done field work on many continents and has a global understanding of numerous topics in geology, geochemistry, petrology, mineralogy, and regional geology. His knowledge is both broad and deep in all those fields and several more. And although his early expertise was in experimental petrology, he's a superb mapper in a vast array of geologic environments and at various scales. In economic geology, Mark's probably most famous for his work on iron oxide copper gold deposits, but he has world-class expertise in many other areas, including porphyry deposits, scarn and carbonate replacement deposits, sediment hosted systems mined for copper, cobalt, silver, uranium, and vanadium, including the, the Keck funded project, 
and also in Carlin-type gold deposits, which are the focus of his talk today, uh, which will be quite unusual given that uh, he's presenting it uh, while lying on his back at a rehabilitation facility in Grand Junction, Colorado, and it's a pleasure to welcome Mark back. Okay. Well, well, thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Eric. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe overly generous words. I've always felt like uh, just I love geology, and there's so many interesting problems out there. And uh, as Eric says, one of my passions is is just uh, you know how how humanity deals with earth materials is is both uh, an enormous uh, scientific challenge in in sort of all, all areas. Uh, and it's uh, an enormously important, uh, particularly as we go forward with, uh, with the green economy and so on in there. Well, gold isn't necessarily essential to that, but uh, I chose uh, long ago at the beginning of the semester when Pete asked me about giving a talk, I thought, well, I've never given a talk on uh, something that Eric and I have worked on together, really dating uh, back to uh, back to the early days, as Eric just, just mentioned. And so I've titled this uh, somewhat tongue in cheek, Black Gold, Yellow Gold, and Heresy, Crustal Extension, Alkaline Lakes, and the Origin of the World's great, Second Greatest Gold uh, Province. And it's really a different view of the Eocene hydrothermal systems uh, in the Northern Great Basin. And so Eric, and, and importantly, uh, our recent PhD student a few years ago, Caleb King, uh, have uh, contributed in in many ways uh, to, uh, to today's story. Let me see if I can actually, now wondering why, oh, there we go, advance the slide. So the fundamental question is here, is why did the Eocene of the Northern Great Basin uh, result in the world's second greatest gold field? And by this, there's uh, arguably, there's greater than half a billion ounces of gold. So this is really second only to the Witz Waters Rand uh, in South Africa. At today's prices, this would be greater than a trillion dollars. And it's mainly, although not exclusively, uh, in so-called Carlin-type deposits. And as you can see in the slide here outlined in the gold area, but particularly in sort of northeastern Nevada, uh, it's a relatively limited part of the world. It's a limited part of the world in terms of the overall scope of, of middle tertiary magmatism. It's a limited part of the world in terms of the, the scope of, of crustal extension, of tertiary crustal extension. So why is this such an unusual area? Well, this is actually quite an old slide, almost 25 years old now. And I title it just sort of coincidence and heresy. And I will develop this, this theme as we go on. So here again is the state of Nevada. Uh, although the, a lot of the things here would be updated with the last 25 years of understanding of extension. Uh, Eric's compilation from the early 90s uh, combined with uh, an understanding of say the Eocene lacustrine rocks, which spread out across much of this part of the world, correspond uh, crudely speaking, or at least broadly speaking, with the distribution of this rather distinctive type and globally very anomalous group, group of deposits. So is this just coincidence or is there sort of a heretical model that is important in thinking about what goes on in that? So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, explore first kind of the dogma in here after talking a little bit about what's in the, um, what Carlin type deposits are. So what are Carlin type deposits? Well, they're gold rich, uh, considerably often in excess of silver. And so that's unusual in terms of a geochemical abundance. Uh, silver is typically about uh, 15 to 20 times as abundant as gold. So they're also base metal poor. They have a distinctive suite of largely toxic trace elements in there. They're sediment hosted. Uh, in there, there's some exceptions to that. And they're, they're essentially exclusively low temperature, below about 250 degrees. And that's, that's significant. As I've already mentioned, they're the second largest in the world. And they were recognized as a distinct type only within the last few decades, really since, well, the last half century now, basically since the 1960s and really uh, gained prominent attention in the, uh, in the 1980s. And if you look at the, uh, the plot in the lower right, you can see down here, hard to read the things. This is gold, US gold production. And you can see how uh, Carlin type production uh, up through about 2000 in that plot really dominates US production and has been even more so over the last 20 years. 
that's in there. They're more or less unique to the Northern Great Basin. And I would argue that uh, their origin is enigmatic and it's, it's a, something we need to think about. So one of my favorite papers, of course, and familiar to many of you is, is uh, T.C. Chamberlain's paper, The Method of Multiple Working Hypotheses. And this is one of the quotes out of it. The explanation offered for a given phenomenon is naturally under the impulse of self-consistency offered for like phenomena as they present themselves. And there soon developed a general theory explanatory of a large class of phenomena similar to the original one. In other words, it's natural to think that if we have one explanation, it's going to fit everything. But I like uh, the method of multiple working hypotheses. And I, it wasn't until recently I learned about the subtitle in here, which I, I think is really great. With this method, the dangers of parental affection for a favorite theory can be circumvented. So I'm trying to, uh, to avoid parental affection for a theory that actually is one of my favorites in thinking about the scope of ore deposits. Uh, as I'll develop here in a moment, oops. So most mineral deposits, just sort of stepping back for those of you who haven't, haven't thought much about these things, turns out they're really emergent systems. And that by that, I mean that they're the favorable, but often quite rare sort of coincidence or superposition of very typical geological processes and typical geochemistries that concentrate one or more elements. And different kind of, therefore different combinations can lead to similar enrichments of elements. And this really leads to the uh, sort of aphorism of gold is where you find it. Well, gold has, uh, as I'll show in a, in a little bit, gold has a pretty well understood geochemistry. And there are a lot of geologic settings where gold can be concentrated if things come together. But world-class occurrences like the Carlin deposits are often one of a kind. So the, the sketch diagram down at the bottom sort of illustrates schematically how a variety of things have to come together to make, make a deposit. We need to have some sort of source material. That might be a source of fluids, perhaps favorable ligands in those fluids that would dissolve something. It needs to maybe be coming out of a rock or a magma or something along the way. We need to have some, some uh, physical process that transports and focuses that type of material. We need to have a favorable depositional site in that. And obviously there's some sort of exhaust as material gets taken through. So without any one of these along the way, we're not gonna make a deposit. If we don't have sufficient volumes of these things or sufficient energy content, we're not going to make a deposit that's in there. So that comes back to thinking about sort of the Carlin type systems and say, well, the geochemistry is pretty common. A lot of the other things are pretty common, but there's something here that's, that's rather unusual. So here from a, from a paper that Eric and I did a number of years ago is a sort of schematic cross sections illustrating some of the alternative hypotheses. On the right is the sort of the canonical uh, accepted view, which is that fluids, uh, waters that are um, exolved as a hydrous magma cools uh, are expelled and they, uh, they move generally to down the hydrologic gradient, they cool and and precipitate a whole bunch of things. And, and that's, a, that's a very well-established mechanism. Some other mechanisms that may be, uh, may be well-established in other areas, but uh, Eric and I have both been thinking about for Carlin type deposits, what I term the heretical views on the left is one, perhaps they're surface derived waters that come down some appropriate um, uh, hydrologic gradient, maybe you're warmed, come down may, perhaps to approximating the brittle ductile transition going back toward the surface, or alternatively, they're metamorphic waters if there's active metamorphism and devolatilization. So here are, a lot of, here are some of the possible ways that fluids can move around in the Earth's crust. And uh, without adding any of the geochemistry or the details to it, are all things that uh, have been uh, at least entertained for the, for the Carlin type systems. So magmatic hydrothermal system. So this is the one on the right there. It's a very successful approach. There's an enormous amount of, of compelling geologic evidence in, in different environments. And that includes things like active systems on the left. This is a view of the White Island volcano, which unfortunately killed a number of people last year in a, in a tragedy with tourism there. But the, the idea of that exolution of, of, of uh, magmatic fluids, aqueous fluids carrying metals can be, uh, can be supported in all kinds of different scenarios. The sketch in the lower left shows um, a schematic uh, illustration, uh, again, going back to some classic work on, 
on these types of things, where the, the inference is that the release of fluids, perhaps analog, broadly analogous to what's on the right, go out and as they cool, the distal portions or cooler portions of those things create uh, the types of deposits. So this is a very successful approach in many environments. It makes many testable predictions. Is it unique or even the best? And uh, so for example, we can start, and I'm not gonna go through the diagrams here, but I just wanna make the point that tremendous amount of experimental evidence, isotopic evidence, and geologic evidence uh, let us understand what cooling magmatic fluids do. They'll precipitate minerals like quartz, they'll precipitate minerals or uh, metals along the way, they'll change the compositions of the rocks, for example, the more potassium-rich rocks in there, and create uh, the type of thing that we see uh, in, not innumerable, but literally tens of thousands of times uh, in, the, uh, in the upper part of the Earth's crust. So we pretty well understand what goes on in magmatic hydrothermal systems. We also understand gold solubility pretty well. In this diagram, which shows uh, pH across the bottom and oxidation state increasing upwards, the, the colored portions of this show that there, there are certain areas in there that, that are really very favorable for, for gold solubility. So if we need that transport component of this, uh, fluids of, of certain geochemical uh, ranges are going to be good for transporting gold, but many other conditions would not be. And I just draw your attention to the little red uh, triangle that's in there, which is the maximum in that. And this is this is its sort of moderate or slightly, actually slightly alkaline pHs, moderately oxidized conditions, and with a fair amount of, of reduced sulfur in there. And so we'll come back to this later on in uh, thinking about what goes on. So in Carlin type deposits, there are of, you know, in, in terms of the uh, sort of the economic geology and, and others who care about these things, I'd say that 90% uh, um, are magmatists. They believe in the, uh, the postulated magmatic hydrothermal origin. And indeed it's quite, quite elaborate as the figure on the left, which is out of a nature paper, everything from a subduction component and uh, you know, quite, a, quite an elaborate uh, model that, that gets materials into the upper crust to make, make these types of things. A lot of geologic evidence that shows that at least in some places, there is a, a, a spatial coincidence with magmatism and, and broadly speaking, a temporal coincidence with that. So this, this approach or this uh, hypothesis is supported by similar timing, ladiocene uh, that's in there and the, a common but not universal spatial coincidence. And, a, and I will say, emphasize a partly permissive geochemistry. Now today, I'm not gonna get into the details of that. But one of the things it does is it begs the question, well, what's distinctive about uh, the Eocene and North, Northeastern Nevada? A lot of the magma types that are there are actually quite widespread. They come down even uh, similarities coming down through Arizona and going into Mexico. Why is it that the Carlin type systems are actually quite distinct in terms of their spatial extent and um, their low temperature nature from other, other gold systems? And <clears throat> then could we actually test this, this hypothesis by looking at what possible magmatic sources uh, look like? So let's take a look at the, at the magmatic uh, hypothesis here uh, in terms of evidence on it. So starting with the geochemistry, this is, this is from a, a review paper a number of years ago, but just shows that from the stable isotopes to so this diagram on the right is, a, is a, the classic uh, uh, hydrogen uh, versus oxygen uh, isotopic uh, plot of meteoric water line coming here along the, the left side of that, and then data from these deposits. Now, obviously, there's a tremendous amount on there. And one of the key things that, that has been established by careful field work by others is that there is a, a mix of, of meteoric or waters that are probably uh, surface derived that look here in the lower left that look like maybe mid tertiary surface waters. But there are also waters that get up into compositions that are much more like uh, magmatic waters. They have uh, heavier or uh, more deuterium enriched uh, hydrogen in it, and they have more uh, oxygen 18 enriched uh, values in there. And so this uh, is approaching uh, sort of classic magmatic 
uh, water values. And so it's a, a piece of the evidence that shows that uh, <clears throat> maybe this is interpreted to be a mix of, of magmatic rock and, and meteoric waters in there. And to a, to a large degree, I, I, frankly, I believe that. I mean, I agree with that, uh, but it's non-unique. And as I will show, uh, there, are, there are alternative uh, sources and, and possibilities. Okay, let me see here. I had a, a, an admission that I guess I needed to do on that. All right, what's going on? Oh, here we go. Radiogenic isotopes, I won't talk about this was from a, from a more detailed earlier version of this talk. But fundamentally, when we look at lots of radiogenic isotopes, they're non-unique. A lot of it looks like sort of upper crustal material. Uh, it doesn't necessarily say where the golds come from, but really the, the key thing in this is that if you're going to apply uh, isotopic tools or many other geochemical tools, we really need to understand what the geology is. And that's where the, the critical mapping and understanding time-space relationships uh, comes into, um, into these studies. So one of the things that, uh, that Eric and I have been interested in over many years is not just to look at a single uh, type of deposit, but really to do that comparison. And this is a busy figure, but the map on the right is uh, East Central uh, Nevada with the Utah line would be just over on the very far side. So this is uh, White Pine County. For those of you familiar with Great Basin geography, uh, the town of, of Ely is there, town of Eureka. And the location isn't so important, except that what we have done here is we have systematically looked at uh, you know dozens of different types of hydrothermal systems that are mineralized in different ways. And the explanation on the left, without going through all the details of it, you may notice intrusion-related deposits. And there are all kinds of different compositions in there. And indeed, there's a beautiful correlation between different sorts of compositions with the associated uh, metal types in here. This is a great illustration uh, in the, you know, the North Central Great Basin of where we can look at, at magma types and actually see, yeah, if we, uh, if we take some care and look at this, what's out there, this, is, uh, this fits very nicely into uh, sort of the canonical magmatic hydrothermal model. And there's lots to learn about it, but uh, I feel pretty confident that we have a, a sense of what goes on. Well, in this same area, there are actually many, many Carlin type deposits, not some of the, the biggest ones. Well, actually some of the very largest ones, probably are pushing hundred million ounces is just up here in the, in the Cortez you know, range. But I'm going to take a, take a quick look at a couple of these areas and illustrate some of the complexity. So the take home message from this slide, lots of things out there. We need to look carefully uh, at that comparison. Same piece of crust, somewhat different magmas, different times in there. How does that relate or not relate to the, to the uh, different types of, of magmatism? So a few years ago, uh, many of you may remember, a number of you may remember Ali Mako did her, her master's with us. And one of the approaches that we've taken is to use the, uh, the crustal extension, essentially those cross sections generated by mid tertiary extension to look at a three dimensional view of the hydrothermal systems. And in Ali's work, she worked in the Egan range, an area that uh, Phil Gans is at uh, UCSB, worked on for his master's thesis many years ago. And essentially that area gives us about a 10 kilometer crustal cross section through one of these uh, magmatic systems. And what we found there is that we can actually put together in a, in a three-dimensional view, a very systematic approach. There are deep so-called porphyry style mineralization in the, in the deeper portion. So in this lower, lower figure, that's some of the green blobs on that. Um, systematic sort of evolution of, the, of this uh, composite magma chamber and at shallower levels it goes up into things that have silver, lead, zinc, and some other types of materials. In that area, it turns out that there are some, some uh, spatially associated uh, Carlin type uh, deposits, these gold deposits. So the question is, are they distal or are they unrelated? So here's a place where, where one could you know, come in, we have come in and, and looked at it fairly carefully, and we really can't answer the question. We've learned some interesting, of course, some quite interesting things about it, but it's, it's certainly not definitive in there. Uh, one of the other complexities, this is, this is actually the area I was working with the USGS as a 
graduate student is the Eureka District. The Eureka District has multiple hydrothermal systems superimposed on it, and those are all the different colors on there, including Carlin type things. It's one god awful mess, frankly. I mean, there's some some lots of really cool things going on and sort of detailed ins insights, but this illustrates uh, what is is often the case. If I wanted to make a case for the relationship of the Carlin type things, I could potentially relate it to an early Cretaceous intrusion. I could potentially relate it to a late Cretaceous intrusion. I could potentially relate it to an Eocene intrusions in here. I could potentially say it's unrelated to those types of things. But there are distinctive spatial patterns. So one starts to get the inkling um, in looking at this that that although the all of those systems that are related to fluid flow systems related to igneous activity, they have pretty systematic patterns and they have scales of a few kilometers across. The gold deposits are actually structurally controlled. They go along one of the structural highs with a lot of, a lot of other uh, faulting associated with it and extend for perhaps 20 kilometers north south and are, are basically agnostic with regard to uh, to the magmatic systems that are there. So it's a suggestion, yeah, you could, make, uh, you could make the argument there, but there's no compelling evidence to tie these. And indeed the, the difference in the spatial distribution is, a, is a intriguing at least, if not a, a, you know, a, a compelling uh, argument that there's something else going on uh, in, in that area. So an exceptional place for this is the locus of Caleb King's masters and PhD systems. And this is the Battle Mountain area. And this is in uh, North Central Nevada, the little red spot there in the, in the inset map of Nevada. So it's a major district. It has multiple Eocene intrusive centers with gold and copper. And there's no question that some of the gold and copper is associated with those igneous rocks. Excellent geologic context from a lot of work that's been done there. And Caleb uh, started working on this with support from, from Newmont Mining uh, a number of years ago. He'd come back to school after working for them. And uh, they were interested in doing some, some additional exploration in that. And I'll, I'll come back to some of the things uh, in a moment with regard to Caleb. So here was a place that we thought, okay, here we can look at, we see gold and copper associated with the intrusive rocks. We see some things that actually are out on the periphery that that at least uh, arguably look like Carlin type deposits. So let's see if we can make a more compelling argument uh, in this area. It doesn't have some of, the, some of the other complexities that the Eureka district had. So in the Battle Mountain district, as I said, classic porphyry style alteration um, in this uh, beautiful uh, replacement of carbonate rocks. These are uh, this type of replacement or what we call scarns in here, andradite to pyrotite uh, bearing you know, gold rich scarns and interpreted by some to be related to distinctive reduced magmas. That's kind of a detail which I, I didn't, <laughs> didn't cut out of this. So could this be an analog for the magmatic source for carlin-type carlin -type deposits? Well, if we look at the Battle Mountain igneous rocks, first of all, we find that they're, that although the contention had been made that they were unusually reduced and that has some ties into potential gold geochemistry, they're actually pretty darn ordinary calc alkaline rocks. They're magnetite, titanite bearing, the fluids that would come out would have sulfur dioxide and H2S in them. And in fact, they're similar to porphyry copper gold deposits worldwide. And they're like a lot of other Great Basin and Eocene intrusions. And so it's, you know, there's nothing, nothing distinctive about these things. Um, and indeed we can, uh, with, I'm not gonna go through all the diagrams, but the diagrams here show ratios of, of um, the uh, uh, basically that are indicative of the oxidation state and the sulfidation state there. And we can start with a fluid in the lower left one that is a, a plausible magmatic fluid. And we can go through modeling from magmatic temperatures at 700 to sort of high temperature hydrothermal temperatures at about 500 where I'm pointing to 550, pointing to on the lower left and then down to 350 degrees and essentially can model the, the whole sequence of events you know, through that in a, in a very systematic way associated with those, those, those centers uh, that are in there. However, when we look in the, uh, in the Battle Mountain District, we see that there are actually two different types. So the geologic mapping 
and understanding what's out there is pretty important. So the magmatic hydrothermal things, the things that are clearly associated with the igneous centers are over here on this diagram on the right. And essentially they follow in this, this path that uh, is governed by fluid chemistry going down to the lower left. However, there is a type, as I mentioned in red up at the top, sort of the Labrador surprise type of mineralization is distinct. It's oxidized and it's, it's much lower uh, in its sulfur content. So there's a, you look at this and oh, it actually breaks out. So this isn't all just one type of thing. There must be something else going on here. And so <clears throat> when we look at the magmatic hydrothermal hypothesis, we see that there's an excellent correspondence with many moderate to high temperature uh, ores, including things in the Battle Mountain and really across the Great Basin and many other places. Uh, but it's really equivalent for the Carlin type deposits because it's consistent with, but really not demanded by some of the geological and geochemical evidence. There's no consistent correlation in space with, in space with magmas or with magma composition. So what about some other evidence? What are some of the alternatives that might go? So let's come back to some of the heretical uh, views in that. And I'm gonna stick with Battle Mountain for a moment. So let's come back first to just the idea of what would happen if there was a fluid that was circulated uh, by the heat of the magma, but a, a, an external fluid that was in there. So a magmatic fluid shown in this inset to the upper right on a pressure temperature diagram, it's gonna have a cooling path and do certain things. But if we have an external fluid, it will warm first in the diagram here on the, in the lower left, lower center portion of it, and then it'll come back toward the surface. And because of the way that it crosses solubility contours and so on there, it's gonna make a very different suite of uh, alteration types. It's gonna change the rocks and in in the rock compositions in a systematically different way. And the sketches over on the right are from, a, from another paper that uh, uh, Eric and I have done just show some of the possibilities for, for distribution around an idealized center. So let's go back to Battle Mountain and see, okay, well, what do we actually see there? Uh, and what we see are, are, are things like this. So this is a rock from actually someplace else. This shows that superposition. So here is a thin section billet. We're looking at a few centimeters across. This is a granodiorite. Here's a quartz vein that comes through. That's a quartz vein that was precipitated by that cooling magmatic fluid. It's making biotite over here, a potassium rich mineral in it. But what's this white stuff over on the left? This white stuff is actually a place where quartz has been dissolved. That quartz vein has been dissolved. There's porosity along there. And the white is actually all sodium feldspar, all albite. So here's a very different uh, part of a fluid path. This would be consistent with a warming fluid path, perhaps of an external fluid, or most likely of something like an external fluid. So back in the Battle Mountain District, one of the things that uh, Caleb discovered there, and I remember very distinctly, he came into, into my office after coming back from his field season and said, I found a bunch of sodic calcic alteration out there. And I said, Caleb, that is um, BS. I think I used the whole, whole phrase in that context, but I said, you know, look, we all know that there's a lot of Jurassic sodic calcic alteration throughout the Great Basin really coming down into into Arizona, but you know nobody's ever reported it out there. I'm sure, you know, you must be mistaken. So, you know, as a good good student would, he he pulled out the rocks and said, "Well, look at this." And sure as heck, uh, that's that's what was there. And and it turns out that soda calcic alteration is actually quite common there. It's associated with this, this distinctive low sulfur. Uh, Labrador surprise and Caleb's mapping. So here he is proudly showing off some of the unusual mineralogy that he found uh, is, is really very extensive out there. It's remarkable given the amount of geologic work that's, that's been done in this area, which you know probably 50 man years by different types of groups that, that people hadn't recognized this, but it's widespread. And it turns out that it's actually very common uh, in the Eocene. Uh, in Eocene intrusions, if you're looking in the upper portion of that. So here is just uh, uh, some of uh, Caleb's early mapping showing that distribution. Uh, the um, uh, rocks and so on are showing some of the, some of the different features uh, that are in that. So part of his dissertation was looking at the, uh, uh, at the stable isotopes in there, which I mentioned before. And what he was able to show very nicely is that there were two different fluids that were involved in these different 
now what we recognize as different superimposed systems. There was one set of fluids that was associated with the potassium rich alteration and other things uh, that was relatively isotopically light or have lower values on it. That's pretty clearly magmatic origin in it. But there was another set that was associated with the uh, actinolite and other things in there that's quite distinct, uh, quite distinct in its composition and almost surely uh, represents basinal fluids and indeed fluid inclusions and other evidence. I think it's pretty unequivocal that this is a, a non-magmatic fluid probably coming in from what, what it, whatever was in the ambient uh, host rocks uh, there at that time. So we're seeing evidence of two different fluids and, and you can think of, well, what are the magmas doing in this? Are the magmas really contributing uh, anything fundamental to it? I would argue that at least for these sorts of things, what they're doing is essentially they're a big hot finger that comes up into the upper soggy sedimentary crust and it's circulating fluids. And essentially because it's circulating fluids up to relatively high temperatures, maybe 450 or 500 degrees, they interact with the rock and they're giving us a fingerprint because of the alteration of the presence of those fluids and the ability to circulate them. Is this fundamental to the Carlin type systems? I actually don't think so, but it's very clear evidence that there are other fluids that are there and that they have a, a rather distinctive uh, geochemistry. So these things, as it turns out, we went out and, and visited a bunch of intrusions and there, there are a dozen or more of them out there, including a whole bunch of them around sort of the classic Carlin trend that are in this. In fact, they surround the Carlin trend. So what are some, uh, <clears throat> what are possible consequences of some other drives and, and other fluid sources? So now I wanna turn away from that sort of uh, thinking about uh, the magmatic process, the, the canonical ma magmatic hydrothermal process, fluids coming out, all the things that we can predict. It's, it's okay, but there's some real problems in terms of correlation and understanding the overall spatial, spatial distribution with that. So I want to think about thermal convection of fluids as a, as a natural re result just of high permeability and heat and think about, well, what could the possible surface fluids be? Are they fresh, moderately saline? Are they quite saline? What's possible common in Western North America? And what would be the mass transfer consequences of that? So let's, let's explore some of these possibilities. Well, first of all, just a, a reminder or an introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Here's a classic figure from uh, Turcotte and Schubert's uh, geodynamics text, my older uh, version of that. And basically the take home point here is that if we have uh, moderate permeabilities and quite plausible permeabilities in the upper crust and reasonable geothermal gradients, nothing really exceptional, we can uh, institute sort of free convection in that if there's enough you know, connected permeability in there. So that suggests, well, maybe if we have a bunch of clastic sediments, other things, stuff that's getting beat up by extensional faulting, uh, this is something that we should consider. Is it, is it a possibility? And it fits within a range of, of a lot of metal measured permeabilities. In the summary from a Brooks Hansen paper on the right side of that. Well, it turns out the modern Great Basin actually has some pretty spectacular examples of this. So here's a map from the um, Great Basin Geothermal uh, Center on that, and it's it's hard to read in there, but but basically when we look at the uh, at the Great Basin in there, we see that there are some obvious magmatic driven. These might be thermal convection, or they might be magmatic fluids, geothermal systems. For example, along the Sierra front, uh, Coso, Long Valley, all the way up into the you know southern end of the Cascades at at, uh, at Mount Lassen. No question, what's going on in those. However, particularly in northeastern or northwestern Nevada, in the area that's, that's been uh, historically has had quite a bit of seismicity in it, there are a lot of uh, geothermal systems out there, some of which produce power today from relatively high temperatures. What we term amagmatic systems, there's no associated or even recent magmatism known there. We can't preclude things at depth, but there's really no evidence for, uh, for uh, transfer of heat into the mid or upper crust by uh, by magmas. However, there is a close link to active extensional faulting. A number of these are greater than 150 degrees. The ones that produce geothermal power are typically greater than 200 uh, degrees out there. And these would include things like Dixie Valley, Nightingale or Brady, Beowowie, and so on. 
Uh, so there are quite a few of those and, and then low temperature systems that are operating today that look like fundamentally they're driven by the crust being broken up and essentially fluids mining the heat from somewhere down there, the brittle transition coming up along structures and, and uh, <clears throat> ultimately getting to, into the near surface environment. So many possible fluids that are there. So here's a, here's an, a range of some, some possible fluids. And just to illustrate on this, and this is from Eastern California, but sort of il illustrative of what goes on. And I'd note that there are key variations here in sulfur and chlorine and in the total concentration. So why are these important? Well, things like sulfur turn out to be important for transporting gold and some other elements. Chloride is very important for transporting many other elements, alkalis, most base metals and so on in here. And total concentration, the more, the more of these things we have, other things being equal, the more stuff we can move around. Well, when we look at Eastern California, come over here to the right-hand side of this table and you can see that the total dissolved solids and particularly the chloride in here you know, there are orders of magnitude variation from essentially fresh waters uh, in uh, surface and in some of the geothermal systems to intermediate salinities to in the southern part of um, the eastern California in the salt and sea geothermal system. This is circulating fluids that are close to the saturation with salt, 25% uh, dissolved solids in there. And this is actually a great modern example of what Eric mentioned in the introduction of a of an iron oxide copper gold system uh, that's in that. And that's enough of that for today. What I'd like to look at is actually the nature of fluids uh, as we have today in, in modern Mono Lake. So what are those? So here are, are two, two um, rows in the table, both the, the modern lake system and the upper row that's in there, and then the warm springs that are coming out in the lower row. And I just draw your attention to Mono Lake as a classic example of a sodium carbonate, sodium sulfate lake, whereas in the, uh, in the salt sea down there at the bottom, basically very relatively little carbonate, basically no sulfate in it. This is a very different type of, type of composition that's in there. Water at salinity is a few percent that's in that. But notice what else is in here. A lot of arsenic. It's pretty typical actually of these kinds of lakes that's in there. A uh, fair amount of reduced content to it. And in the warm spring, quite a bit of uh, hydrogen sulfide that's coming out uh, associated with that. So that's, a, that's kind of interesting. So what happens when we compare that to Carlin type fluids? So uh, there is the arsenic. And we find out, well, the, from the review papers, sort of the, the consensus, these things are coming out at about you know, somewhere a few percent um, uh, total salts dissolved in it. Turns out that the, uh, the H2S content is pretty darn similar to the types of uh, contents that are seen in, uh, in, in Carlin type systems or inferred in, uh, in Carlin type systems to, to transport gold. So well, here's a different kind of surface fluid. What, what might be going on there? What if we look at some of the isotopic data on these types of things? And, and here I've taken that same diagram, but from before, a few years ago on our field course, we collected a sample of water and uh, Dave Detman, uh, you know, analyzed it for us. And there we are. It's so it's, um, well, that's kind of an interesting, interesting composition. And there are a number of reasons why it gets up into that area. And then the Battle Mountain soda calcic alteration that I mentioned before, well, look where that is. That's, that's almost surely external fluids. These things now are starting to bracket that area that people thought was distinctively magmatic. So hmm, curious. So I'd like to step back then and think about these sodium mono lake type things, these sodium carbonate, sodium sulfate lakes, which still have a fair amount of chloride in them. They're pretty common in terrestrial environment, terrestrial environment, <laughs> I don't know, evaporitic environments. They're biologically productive and, and one of their uh, evidence in the, in the geologic record is, is oil shales and also is, is sort of evaporites. They're widespread in the modern of Western North America, and they're exceptionally abundant in the Eocene of the Western US. And so there are a variety of ways to get to these compositions. So you're in the sort of Oyster and Hardy type of, type of um, uh, liquid line of descent diagram. They're, they're one type of, of evaporite that we, we form in, in terrestrial settings. So 
what is it about exceptionally abundant in the Western US? Well, as, as many of you probably know, the Green River Formation in uh, Utah, Wyoming and, and Northwestern Colorado is really the world's greatest uh, accumulation of oil shales and it's in the greatest accumulation of, of these kinds of evaporites. It's the greatest source of, of trona, economic associate trona of sodium, sodium carbonate that's in there. And these things indeed uh, is spread across uh, northeastern Nevada. They're all broken up now, but uh, and not, not in those volumes, but there were many Eocene lakes out there. We've had talks by other people in the past about sort of the hydrology of these systems, but at their low stands, they're making uh, these types of these types of fluids, and that extends essentially across, uh, across, uh, in many places across northeastern Nevada. Now you might ask the question, reasonably ask the question, well, okay, great, here's where these, these fluids are, but what, you know, there are a lot of places that don't have evidence for that. Now the evidence, of course, could be, could be missing. But another thing to remember about evaporitic fluids is that they have all those dissolved solids in them. And because those dissolved solids, they're more dense, so they're going to displace other waters, and they are in fact going to become part of the uh, of the of the groundwater system uh, in many areas because of that that physical contrast. So <clears throat> there's one piece. Now let's think about the uh, the passive margin, the myogeoclinal system. So this is the these are the framework rocks. So here a uh, 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 classic sort of summary cross section of the stratigraphy going from uh, you know, Utah, uh, sort of the, the Wasatch Front on the, on the uh, east side out across uh, uh, into, uh, into central Nevada. So we have the big accumulation of, of the late Proterozoic into the Cambrian clastic rocks and then the increasing uh, accumulation of the dominantly carbonate rocks. Well, in the, the vicinity of the sort of shelf slope transition, these are largely dirty carbonate rocks. They had a fair amount of iron in them and so on. It turns out those are ideal host rocks for uh, uh, reactive host rocks for a, a, goal, uh, a uh, hydrogen sulfide or a bisulfide bearing gold fluid that comes in uh, that type of fluid. If it comes into a rock that has a bit of uh, iron in it as either iron oxide or an iron bearing component to a carbonate, uh, it will react with the uh, that to make pyrite and to precipitate gold. It strips the sulfur away from the gold and the gold precipitates. So, so indeed where the red box is and is the general areas is, is crudely speaking where we have favorable host rocks and by golly, that's about where the, where the deposits are. The deep clastics I would argue is, is another a piece and, and actually a favorable source. And we'll, we'll look at that uh, here on the next slide. So this is work of Peter Vickery and others from the USGS and what, what Peter did was he went out and, and sampled a lot of these uh, uh, siliciclastic rocks from the deeper portion of the myogeocline. He, he uh, then took the, uh, the pyrites that were in there and used various techniques to actually analyze what was in those, in those pyrites. And as the orange arrows show down at the bottom, the range, they have about one part per million gold in it. Well, that might not sound very, good. and they have a bunch of arsenic in them as well. Well, it might not sound like very much, but when you, you average that out, that pyrite is, uh, comes up to about a crustal abundance, one to 10 parts per billion gold in the rock. So could this be, possibly be a reasonable uh, source if we could come up with a mechanism uh, for looking at these things? So one question to ask is what would it take to make you know, a, a truly world-class gold deposit, 100 million ounces? Well, without going through the calculation here, what we find is that we only have to have a relatively low efficiency from reasonable volumes of rock about the footprint of some of these big trends in here to, to source all of the gold that's found in. There's no need for exceptional large volumes or for efficiencies uh, that are in that. So what about the chemistry? Can we, the, does the chemistry fit? So let's think about taking one of those alkaline lake fluids, one of those green river type fluids or alco formation like fluids and reacting with pyrite. Well, it turns out, and I was hoping to do some, some more sophisticated mass transfer modeling for this talk, but uh, other things intervened. It turns out pyrite, this gold bearing pyrite will break down with these new neutral carbonate fluids by a reaction such as shown here. Pyrite plus that carbonate makes iron carbonate and then a bit of bisulfide, a bit of 
H2S, and a bit of sulfate. Well, where does that clot? That clot smack in the middle of maximum gold solubility. So if those alkaline lake fluids could get down here and interact with that pyrite, they would break it down and that should be ideal conditions for, for moving gold around. As those fluids come up toward the surface, we can do sort of geochemical modeling on it. They were generated by this process. They're essentially as the same as inferred from the deposit studies and really can account for the observations. They can account for the way the carbonate is dissolved from it, for the precipitation of silica, for the types of uh, uh, precipitation of gold is, is sort of gold bearing pyrite by sulfidation of the, of the bits of, uh, of iron that are in the, uh, in the sedimentary section and in, in other kinds of rocks as well. If they're basalts in the section or other things, they, they're, they're reactive with respect to the same, same material. So coming to the conclusion here, why did the Eocene of the Northern Great Basin produce the world's second largest uh, gold field? And I would argue that this is an, a sort of an exceptional sort of emergent process here. We have an unusual com combination of really rather pedestrian geologic features. Now, terrestrial environment evaporites aren't that common. Uh, <clears throat> and a rather pedestrian geochemistry that have coincided to, to generate this distinctive widespread characteristic uh, type of alteration, which has, uh, as part of it, has brought that in. There's a, so if we go back to the source sort of transport deposition, we have favorable source rocks. We can show that we could mobilize things out of it. We have favorable host rocks. It's atypical but not exceptional fluid sources and, and they clearly overlap in this area. And we have a widespread physical drive that's in there, which would be the extensional faulting and perhaps additional uh, magmatic heat. Now my phone is uh, ringing over there and I'm not going to be able to wheel over and get to it. So forgive the, uh, forgive the music in the background. Alternative models, though successful elsewhere, and, and at least locally in this area, fail on, on the basis of multiple criteria. So is it just coincidence? Is this heretical model there? Oh, I would say this is in the spirit of multiple working hypotheses. This is something that needs to think about. Other things really aren't very satisfactory. People uh, you know, can convince themselves, yeah, I, this is my, my favorite child and I'm going to apply it here, but I, I would contend that uh, we're, we're far from understanding what goes on in it. So I'd say, or, is that what goes on or simply do we have many things yet to learn? And I would say there's an enormous richness uh, in the Western US to uh, begin to look at, at a whole variety of, of features that we've really only begun to scratch the surface on. We have a 150 years of magnificent work by many people uh, establishing geologic framework, but I think there's, there's another 150 years of, of, of things to continue to learn. So I'd like to finish with a quote that uh, came to my attention from, uh, from Vic Baker and uh, <clears throat> I, I really like this one too. Advances in geology in the past have been made by outraging in one way or another a body of preconceived opinions. We may be pretty sure that advances yet to be made in geology will be at first regarded as outrages upon accumulated convictions of today, which are, we are too prone to regard as geologically sacred. So with that, I actually finished on time, I think. I thank you all for, uh, for joining. Woo! So I will uh, stop swimming there and go back to uh, here, here I am and wave at everybody. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, we have some time for questions. And you can either raise your hand or uh, just send some questions by chat. OK, I'll turn on the chat here to see. I can read them out for you, Mark. No worries. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've got a question from Barbara. Barbara says, hi, Mark. Could some of these atypical fluids come from melting related to removal of a potential flat slab? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And that, that's the type of hypothesis that we'd like to, uh, like to be able to assess more directly. I mean, the types of things, for example, that Ananya is doing have um, you know, her interest in, in 
doing the experimental petrology on, on subductive fluids, you know, could do this. And I could construct a, you know, an ad, ad hoc hypothesis that could do that. Uh, in this particular area, the, the question I would pose is that given what we understand about sort of the, you know, laramide uh, and, and sort of post laramide tectonics, regardless of, you know, a taco model or whatever that's coming into this, uh, it's a relatively, perhaps a relatively restricted area and it would beg the question of, of why should it be in that, that particular part of the world. Um, but absolutely, I think that's, that's another, another hypothesis that uh, maybe may be challenging to test, but uh, part of what's possible, you know, looking forward. We have another question uh, from Lydia in the chat. Lydia says, very interesting. So given one of your last few slides, I'm assuming no, but was wondering if there are any similar gold deposits that have been found near Green River in Utah slash Wyoming. Yeah, so so I've actually wondered, I've done some, uh, you know, you when you get into sort of the geochemistry of these things and thinking about the physics, you can, you know, you can dream up all kinds of scenarios and actually it's a pretty rich opportunity for unconventional mineral exploration. So uh, I have actually wondered, okay, if you can generate these, these types of fluids moderately alkaline, it should be in there. So what, what, and so the short answer is no, I'm not aware of anything out there and I, I'm not certain people would have recognized it, but uh, I suspect a lot of people, you know, have looked at trumped over that that kind of ground. So what would be missing in that area? It's got the fluid source, but does it have the hydrologic system? Does it have the physical drive uh, that would get things down? Does it have the the source that is represented by the you know the neoproterozoic rocks of the Maya geocline? So there might be other ways to mobilize those fluids as you go across northern Utah, you know, into uh, into the sort of the prime Green Green River. Uh, terrain, but you know, not not necessarily. I'd actually love to know what the gold content is of those warm springs uh, in Mono Lake. Uh, they're being driven by magmatic heat, but that's clearly recirculated uh, fluid uh, from the uh, um, uh, clearly recirculated lake water of, of various various stands in the in the, that uh, Pleistocene lake system. Okay, Vic Baker has a question. Vic, go ahead. Actually, not a question. It's a comment. Since you mentioned outrageous geological hypotheses, I thought I would uh, just elaborate a little bit. Please do. Yeah, the outrage is only against our existing theoretical constructs, paradigms, etc. Never do we have the outrage against nature, because nature is always what we're trying to figure out. In fact, we're trying to see as geologists what nature is communicating to us. And we often don't get it right. That's why we have the multiple working hypotheses. Yep. And eventually though, we develop the tools, we develop the insights, we do the testing and the reformulations and in the end, we find nature is the one that's got the truth. Mm -hmm. so the outrage is only against our fallibilistic waving of our hands and the like, trying to figure things out. I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, two quick questions from Chris C in the chat. Chris says, Near the beginning, you showed two main trends in Nevada. What differentiates the Carlin trend versus Battle Mountain Eureka trends? And okay. the second question is, instead of comparing to Mono Lake chemistry, what about the uh, salars of the Altiplano? I suppose these Eocene lakes uh, would be more akin to those on a high standing plateau. Okay, those are great questions. And I see Pete has some, some other follow-up questions in there. So. So I can go on and on about these things. So first of all, to, to Chris's question one, uh, they, these trends are things that have been recognized you know, from early on in there. And I say what, distingu what distinguishes them is just where they are. I wouldn't say that there's anything that's fundamentally different about them. They, they happen to be superimposed on you know, somewhat different pieces of you know, the Cordilleran architecture there. And they have, uh, I mean, there's certainly been a very, very obvious empirical predictive model 
that goes along with it. And there's been a good deal of discussion. Well, are these areas of, of particular weakness, perhaps inherited from the uh, from the Neoproterozoic rifting, and uh, that has somehow been uh, propagated uh, into this. Um, so, uh, but it turns out there are a lot of deposits that are sort of off those trends uh, as well. And it's, it's really a, a question for which we don't have, I think, a, a good answer. Uh, instead of comparing to Mono Lake chemistry, I've been fascinated by the things that have gone, in the, uh, gone on in the Altiplano and thought quite a lot about that. So to my understanding, and I've looked a fair amount at the, at the, uh, at the modern um, uh, hydrochemistry uh, in, the, uh, in the Andes, uh, most of those take a different path than we have in the, uh, uh, in the Cordilleran interior, sort of the Nevada Plano, if you will. In the Altiplano, these go to more classic uh, sodium chloride, sodium carbonate, or excuse me, sodium, uh, sodium chloride, uh, calcium chloride, uh, types of solutions. They get up close to halite, well, they are at halite saturation, for example, Solarity Uni, uh, Solarity Atacama, and so on. Uh, and when you, uh, when you model what would go on in those, you get what's a salt and sea type geothermal system. They're, they're much higher salinity. They tend to have a much higher capacity for base metal transport, sulfurs uh, suppressed, and so on in there. And so there's a lot that goes on. And indeed, they're modern, or at least uh, Neogene uh, systems down there that are examples of, of what I am pretty confident is the circulation of, of those kinds of fluids. And so to Pete's question, kind of following up on that, uh, Pete, you or Barbara or others may know of places where there are uh, these, uh, you know, sodium sulfate, sodium uh, uh, carbonate types of systems that are there. And indeed, I would, you know, that, that's the kind of place I'd go look. I'm not aware of any of them, but uh, it's, a, it's a prediction that would be uh, kind of interesting. It, well, I'd be fascinated actually to follow up on it. Pete, you have your hand raised up. Do you want to follow up on that? Oh, uh, no. That, <laughs> oops, we've got a serious feedback going on here. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I think we I'll can lower my hand. Yeah, that was a good answer, Mark. Thanks. Okay. Well, if I'd, I'd love to know if, if you guys have some examples, but I haven't been able to find any. Okay. A uh, couple more questions, uh, Mark, if you don't mind. Delighted. Asks, hi, Mark. Is there gold in any of the core complex foot walls in Nevada? If so, could the fact that they are exhumed from the mid crust provide insight into broader gold genesis? Okay, so that's that's a great question as well. And the, the short answer is, I am not aware of any such examples. Uh, Eric might know, he's shaking his head too. Uh, there are actually really interesting parallels though, and speaking of a footwell on that. So one of, one of the things that we've started to look at is go out and say, let's, let's take a look. And if this, this outrageous hypothesis has some some legs to it. We ought to be able to test things like that. We ought to be able to get down to where we're seeing that brittle ductile transition. We ought to find the roots of this. We should be able to find some of these types of things. Uh, there's certainly uh, isotopic evidence for fluids being circulated down there. That's been known for a long time down to sort of the, the, uh, the foot wall types of conditions. Where it is interesting, and, and this is a, a bit of a, of a tangent to it, is we get down into Arizona and um, the uh, in the core complexes in Arizona, particularly uh, in, uh, in Western Arizona, but coming down right into, into the Tucson area, into the Catalinas and Rincons, uh, you know, there's very extensive evidence for fluid flow, which people have talked about since the, at least back since the 80s. And in those areas, we see uh, a distinctive iron oxide rich mineralization uh, in that. Fluid inclusions in there are indicative of uh, relatively high salinity fluids, and indeed in somewhat younger rocks than a lot of the extension, but in the extension related basins, there's often quite an accumulation of evaporitic materials, more often gypsum, uh, but, but halite, at least in three big basins, and the Picacho, the Luke, and the, um, I've forgotten the name of it, the one that's up in Northwestern Arizona. So the fluids down here are a bit different. And in that paper that Bob Ilchek and I 
uh, published uh, you know, 20 odd years ago, we suggested that extension might be driving these things, but we actually saw six systematically different types of hydrothermal systems in the north things more with the mono lake types of fluids. And here in, uh, as we get into the southern basin and range, uh, consistent with a different surface environment, these more uh, high salinity, um, you know, iron uh, base metal low sulfur transport systems. So there's a lot of interior, uh, internal at least coherence uh, in the observations, the, the, um, the structure and, and the others. And the deposits here in the Southern Basin Range certainly uh, get down and at least are juxtaposed against. And Max Britt, I think, is going to do his master's thesis on these sorts of things. My class this semester is doing a collective uh, project on, uh, on pulling together evidence and thinking about that, that sort of time space in there. So that's that's a that's a long answer, but yeah, looking looking deeper is a is a key thing, and, and this is a great part of the world to you know to to address that. Okay, we have one one last question, and remember, there's the class after this where you could uh, where everyone's welcome to stay back and uh, continue this discussion. But Kyle has a question here in the chat: uh, Do scientific camps outside of Nevada receive these alternative hypotheses uh, more warmly? For example, experts on the Carlin type deposits of Southwest China. Okay, so uh, good question, Kyle. And uh, obviously the word warmly can be uh, interpreted two ways. <laughs> so in both a, a positive or a, a heated reaction. And I would, uh, I would say that the, uh, the evidence is actually that, um, that there are people, and there, there are a number of people who um, you know, I've talked to and we, Eric and I have advocated this over the years that are, that are certainly willing to entertain these possibilities. When we come to things you know, in China and, and some of the other portions going across Central Asia, there are a lot of, a lot of deposits that have been compared. There are things in the Yukon and so on. There are a lot of deposits that have been compared to Carlin type. Well, what, what actually characterizes the Carlin type deposits themselves? forgetting about the broader system. So if you go back to that early diagram that, that I had of source transport, uh, deposit and so on, we're just talking about that little red blob. What, what people are willing to, to think about there is they say, okay, well, I've got uh, low, relatively low temperatures, it's sediment hosted, um, the gold is associated with, uh, with pyrite that's formed in that. Well, fluids from, from the deep metamorphic source, fluids from distal fluids from a magmatic source, all of these things could make, could make that. There's nothing special about, about the deposits themselves. What's special about Northeastern Nevada is it is in probably two orders of magnitude bigger than any of these other things. And it's in that, that part of the world. So one really needs to step back and take a system scale, if you will, a crustal scale, uh, superficial scale, you know, look at that to put them together. So to, to the point of this, I think there are relatively few people who were, who were, you know, uh, swallowed the Kool-Aid on this, but um, I keep adding sugar to it, hoping that, uh, that that, that'll appeal at least to some. But, you know, the fact is that if it, if it has some predictive power and goes out there, those who are willing to, uh, to entertain this hypothesis might, uh, might learn things that those who are more uh, who uh, receive it warmly in the uh, in the Hadean uh, uh, version might uh, you know might not so it's it comes to uh, you know comes to the point of well the outrageous hypothesis might actually teach us something about what goes on so it looks like there Ananya has another uh, has a question here um, really interesting to see. yes I totally agree with you about studying uh, gold solubility and indeed metal solubility on, in those kinds of environments. There have been a number of experiments done. I mean, a lot of people have looked at sort of aspects of that. Uh, but going back to one of the things Eric didn't mention, a lot of work I did when I was at UCLA was actually on fluid flow and subduction complexes and thinking about the whole, whole mass transfer and, and that kind of environment. We learned a hell of a lot by actually applying anaconda style mapping to uh, to the Catalina Schist out there, which has probably had 150 papers published on it since we worked there uh, on it. And it, it was basically going out and saying, you know, a melange is not just a random mixture. You can go out and you can map that 
And my goodness, there are patterns there and there is really interesting stuff to learn. That may have squat to do with ore deposits, but it has one heck of a lot to do with uh, understanding uh, you know, fluid flow, fundamental mass transfer forward processes in the earth. So there. All right, let's, let's uh, give Mark a break here and uh, thank him once again. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, sort of one for the ages epic talk. Uh, and uh, uh, people, please stay back if you're interested to chat more with Mark for the class conducted by Paul Cap and Marcus after this. Thank you all. Bravo.